A very warm welcome to today's webinar on Watershed Resiliency Planning Lessons from the Danube. My name is Johannes Eigner. I'm the director of OSTA, the Office of Science and Technology at the Austrian Embassy in Washington, D.C. OSTA is more than happy to host today's webinar together with the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. To start with, how did this webinar come into being? Uh, you might be surprised to hear that everything started with an article in the Washington Post from the 30th of October last year entitled, In Vienna, a visionary example of dealing with urban floods. And uh, this article made waves, uh, literally speaking. Uh, immediately after this article was published, a number of people reached out to us at the Austrian Embassy to inquire about the efforts Vienna took to prevent Austria's capital from being flooded during extraordinary flood events and to learn more about Vienna's flood defense. And uh, here we are today, together with the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, we managed to gather a high profile roundtable comprising of specialists for flood mitigation from both sides of the Atlantic. From Vienna, we are joined by Professor Andreas Voigt. Andreas Voigt is Professor of Spatial Development at the Technical University of Vienna. His research and teaching activities focus on sustainable urban and regional development spatial simulation and its theoretical foundations. And in a moment, he will give us an overview on urban development and urban planning in Vienna. From Zurich, Switzerland, we are joined by Bernd Scholl. Bernd Scholl was a full professor for spatial planning and development at the Institute for Spatial and Landscape Planning at the ETH Zurich from 2006 to 2018. His teaching and research focal points are on land and spatial management, infrastructure development, transnational tasks, as well as development and organization of innovative planning processes and methods. As a young researcher, he got directly involved in the planning of the Vienna flood defense. And in a moment, he will talk to us about Vienna, a visionary example of dealing with urban floods. Before we enter into the discussion, uh, a few housekeeping rules. The contributions of Professor Foyt and Professor Scholl will be followed by observations from the US, where technical experts in the Potomac area will detail flood mitigation efforts on the Potomac River and share climate resilient lessons. And then at the end of the program, we will have a question and answer session where participants are encouraged to raise their hand using the Zoom function and once called upon, turn on their video and microphone so that they may address the panel and ask questions. Just for you to know, this meeting will be recorded and made available online following the conclusion of the program. If you don't want to be recorded, you may turn off your camera and microphone for the duration of the webinar. I will now pass on the mic to my colleague Dale Medaris from the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. Dale was instrumental in assembling this panel and we are very, very grateful for his collaboration in bridging Austria and the US together, highlighting what we may learn from one another regarding resilience and climate resiliency projects. Dale, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Johannes, and thank you, Ali. Um, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. My name is Dale Medeiros. I'm a regional planner with the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. We are a uh, council of governments representing the 13 counties, cities, and towns, and 2.5 million people of Northern Virginia. And for many years, we've pioneered a, a special form of global engagement that looks to um, find and apply innovations from overseas 
In particular, we've relied more recently um, on ways in which the uh, our region's academic science and research partners like George Mason University can help us with this, this lesson learning process. Um, and in particular, uh, we're very with the close collaboration that we've been pursuing with George Mason University's Institute for Sustainable Earth, um, who've been um, great in terms of helping us liaise, collaborate on this really important topic of, of climate resiliency um, with our local governmental partners. We have a great constellation of science research and local governmental technical staff together um, to help us open this new chapter of cross-national science and technology research and how it supports local sustainability in general, but climate resiliency initiatives at the local level. So it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Celso Ferrer. Celso is an associate professor in the Civil Infrastructure and Environmental Engineering Department at George Mason University. He leads the Mason Flood Hazards Research Lab. Celso holds a PhD from Texas A&M University in civil engineering, specializing in water resources and coastal engineering, and is a registered professional engineer in the state of Maryland. His current research interests are associated with water-related extreme weather hazards and their impacts on, social, on civil engineering and infrastructure and societies. Celso's work focuses on flood hazards from coastal riverine and urban environments, includes real-time flood forecasting, monitoring storm surges, and supporting uh, collaboration of natural resources and coastal flood defenses. Celso is currently part of uh, the author team of the fifth national climate assessment on coastal effects with the U.S. Global Change Research Program. Celso will be joined by Matt Myers. Matt is the division director with Fairfax County's Office of Environmental and in Energy Coordination. He has 30 years of experience in water resources, including 20 years with the county stormwater management program leading a super talented team monitoring the health of local streams, developing watershed management plans, responding to severe weather emergencies, and implementing ecological restoration and stormwater improvement plans. He also has a master's degree, excuse me, got a, he has a master's degree in environmental systems engineering from Clemson University and an undergraduate degree in environmental resource management from Penn State. And then finally, um, Dr. Daniel Medina, PhD, is the Stormwater Program Manager for the City of Alexandria, Virginia. Daniel has 30 years of experience in water resource planning and program implementation. He obtained his civil engineering degree from the Universidad de los Andes, Bogota, Colombia, and obtained a PhD from Cornell University. His experience encompasses a wide array of water resources areas, including urban water issues, flood risk management, water supply, watershed restoration, and climate resiliency. He has led projects in North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and was recently invited to testify before the U.S. Senate Environment and Public Works Committee on the effects of uncontrolled highway runoff on receiving waters. He is also a consultant for the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. Thank you, Matt, Daniel, Celso, for being part of this conversation. Thank you again, Ali, Dr. Fort, Dr. Scholl, for, for your time. We really look forward to what's to follow. Dr. Foyt, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, estimated colleagues. It's a great pleasure to have this session today. And uh, like in planning, it was based on an initiative. Uh, Dr. Eigner, thank you very much for the good overview and for the coordination of the, the meeting. And uh, of course, I, I would like to uh, thank my colleague, Bernd Scholl, very, very much. He was, was no long discussion that he will join in. And uh, I will give you a, a very brief overview uh, on this urban development uh, planning process in Vienna, but embedded maybe in the European context, which is uh, especially in these days of great importance. As you can see here uh, on this map, uh, Austria, but this is the same like Switzerland and Slovenia and Hungary and Germany and many other countries in Europe. We are right in the middle of Europe. And uh, especially in these days, it's not clear where the, the center of Europe is, uh, but Europe is uh, of importance. As you can see, the distances are very close. This makes it even more clear. This is a map uh, based on the Centrop, which is a, a uh, initiative to coordinate uh, uh, countries from Austria, federal uh, 
uh, countries or provinces, Bundesländer, as we say in Austria or cantons, uh, as uh, we would say in Switzerland. And you can see here with in uh, 500 kilometers, you can reach, uh, of course, Zurich, but you can also reach uh, Lief and all the other uh, cities around. So it's uh, quite, quite close. And uh, this is, makes it very uh, important. The Danube has a long uh, importance for Europe. Uh, it's the second uh, longest river of Europe, as uh, Bernd Scholl will point out uh, then. And as you can see, many countries are around the, the Danube and it's a, a key, uh, we would say infrastructure, a blue infrastructure for the central uh, heart of Europe. Uh, as you can see here from the map of the Danube region, uh, countries like Germany, uh, Slovenia, the Czech Republic, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Serbia, Hungary, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, Moldavia, and the Ukraine or part of the Ukraine are part of the Danube region as well. Uh, if we tend forward to other basic infrastructure, then the 10 T corridors in Europe are of great importance. And uh, uh, Vienna is in a very good situation that uh, quite many 10 T corridors cross in, in Vienna. There's, for instance, the idea of European 4C railway corridors uh, combining the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, uh, the um, Mediterranean Sea, and of course the Black Sea. And Vienna somehow is always somewhere in between. Uh, this uh, leads to the idea also of the Orient, Mist, uh, Orient East Met corridor. And I had the pleasure to be part of a team. Uh, Bernd Scholl was uh, combining to work on this corridor, let's say from Hamburg to Athens. And there is also, so to say, Vienna somehow in a strategic uh, situation like Bratislava and like Budapest and Belgrade uh, as well. Uh, these are some maps showing, uh, and you can, at, at the end of the, my presentation, you will find also the source uh, to read it. The publication is available on the basis of the German-based, in Hanover-based uh, uh, Academy of Spatial Planning uh, within the Leibniz community. And we found out this is a very important corridor combining the very wealthy and prosperous uh, Northeast to the uh, Southeast of Europe. And it's not only a, a 10T corridor in the sense that it's a railway corridor, but it is, is, is a corridor of spatial development. And the idea is to have a minimum of level of service in all the metropolitan areas, also in the suburban areas and in the rural areas in between, and that this corridor should work from port to port. Uh, with a glimpse to the uh, railway network, you can see uh, Vienna is in a strategic uh, position as well, and I will show later on with the Vienna main station, which was then a, now is a, a, a joint venture, we could say, joining two uh, terminal stations. And you can see here what are the important uh, connections from Paris uh, to Germany, Berlin, uh, via Dresden, or to Poland, uh, Warsaw, Danzig, uh, to Constanze at the Black Sea to Athens to the Adriatic ports of Copa Trieste to Venice, Bologna, and many others. Uh, if you look a little bit closer, then uh, it's quite a unique situation in Europe that uh, two capitals of uh, member states of the European Union, namely uh, the Slovak Republic and Austria, and the capitals are Bratislava, uh, the former Pressburg and Vienna are within a distance of only 60 kilometers. And uh, Vienna, as you can see here, is on the fringe of the Alps. So the Alp, the bow of the Alps is covering uh, France and Italy, Slovenia, uh, Switzerland, of course, uh, 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 and uh, of Austria. And uh, the very, very Eastern part of the Alps are the Vienna woods. And then there is a certain break and the bow of the Kabardian mountains is starting uh, at the fringe of uh, Bratislava. We have the Danube in between as a connecting, let's say, blue infra infrastructure. We have uh, quite, uh, we have two, two and a half, two, three uh, railway connections that are under construction. And it took quite a long time. Uh, for instance, the Northern branch connecting uh, Vienna main station to, with Bratislava main station 
uh, it's still under construction to be electrified. And it took quite a long time from the fall of the Iron Curtain from 89 to now. But in these days, it will come uh, to a successful end. And you can see Lake uh, Neusiedl in the southern part. Uh, and you can also uh, have the idea that uh, Vienna is sur surrounded by, by quite different uh, landscapes. And this is, of course, maybe one of the arguments why Vienna is a very livable place. Uh, part of this uh, research, we studied, of course, the railway connections uh, quite deeply. And uh, we would say uh, Bratislava is a twin city and uh, it should be, uh, so to say, uh, a benefit of this unique situation to cooperate uh, even more in the future. Just showing uh, some slides. Uh, this is the castle of Bratislava, as I mentioned before, only 60 kilometers along the Danube. And Bratislava is a very livable uh, city, city as well. It was once uh, even uh, capital of Hungary. And from the Baroque time, there are quite many uh, palais still uh, uh, there. And uh, yeah, uh, we, I think we are good neighbors now. This is just a few from the uh, castle uh, from Bratislava to the Danube. So if you haven't been there to Vienna, of course, and Bratislava as well, uh, I would recommend very much to go there. Uh, Budapest is uh, another twin city, we could say, of uh, uh, Austria and of course of Vienna, not only because of the common history, but it's quite close and the railway network is really functioning very well. The so-called rail jets that are more or less high speed, uh, but high speed in Austria is maybe not what we have in Spain or in the United States. Uh, it's uh, more or less uh, 150 to 250 kilometers, but it fits very much to the topography and works very well. And these uh, rail jets, for instance, connect uh, Zurich uh, via Vorarlberg, uh, Innsbruck, Salzburg, uh, and then uh, Linz, uh, Vienna, and they go further uh, to Budapest, and this is a very stable and well-functioning uh, connection. So uh, Budapest is in a very strategic uh, situation as well like Vienna. This is a, a view uh, from the hill of Buda to the part of Pest. As you might know, there have been two cities, Buda and Pest, and now this is Budapest on the Danube with many nice bridges and a very uh, livable city as well. Uh, if we go further, you have the view from Vienna even to Sofia via Belgrade. And this is a very important uh, area for Austria, for Vienna as well. And these are other partner cities, uh, not only Budapest and uh, Bratislava, but also Belgrade and Sofia and further on on the way uh, to uh, Athens and Patras and even further to Istanbul. And I think we should invest more and uh, uh, the Austrian uh, foreign uh, office is investing much uh, to, to have it on the agenda and but also from the spatial planning perspective, uh, this Balkan area as we call it and uh, some uh, who are joking but maybe it's not a joke to say the Balkan area starts right at the Nash market uh, in Vienna. Uh, some even go further and say it's now in Munich uh, even, but uh, for sure Vienna could be part of the Balkan area and we should take care of this, this area and invest a lot in strategic and coordinated uh, investment also in infrastructure. And this is the view uh, from the fortress of Kalemikdan uh, to the direction of Vienna, but of course you can't see directly uh, Vienna. Uh, Belgrade, by the way, is a very livable and very nice city there as well. And uh, it's of course a Slavian city, but this is also maybe a benefit of Austria that we have so-called minorities speaking uh, 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 Croatian. And if you understand uh, Croatian, that's the Burgenland Croatian, Gradischanski Hrvati, as we say in Austria, in the Burgenland, they are able to speak uh, also with the colleagues in Slovakia and, uh, and beyond. And I think this is a benefit because we have to work also on the common language. And if you are able to speak the language of the neighbors, then it's more easy to get into uh, contact. Yeah, this is the view, the aerial view uh, on uh, Vienna, uh, a very livable city. I am born in Upper Austria, north of the Danube, north of Linz. 
And uh, I'm, I never said I'm Viennese, but I, I like the city very much. I fall in love immediately in, during my studies. And you can see here also the fringe uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the city, the borderline, uh, as we say, uh, Vienna is both a country, a federal country and the city and the capital of uh, Austria. And in this uh, situation as we have in Austria, the federal countries are responsible for spatial planning. They are making the laws. And uh, Vienna, from that point of view, is in a very comfortable situation because they can make the laws for themselves, uh, uh, so to say. And this is, uh, of course, very, very good. And as you see on the left part, so to say, which is the western part, you can see the fringes uh, of, uh, of the Vienna woods, the very, very eastern part of the Alps. You can see, so to say, from north to south, or better from uh, northwest to southeast, uh, the Danube, the old Danube, the new Danube, uh, and the, the Danube Channel, and you can see the historic city center. As mentioned before, Vienna is embedded in quite a different landscape, so the Vienna woods, the Alps, the Pannonian parts, and many others, and from Vienna, within one hour, uh, not only using the car, it's not so uh, uh, not so uh, favorite anymore in Vienna. We have the, uh, the climate, tike, uh, a climate ticket, we call it now, climate ticket in, in German, uh, in Austrian German. And uh, this is for, for just uh, one less than 1,000 euro, you can use every uh, uh, railway, every bus in Austria from, from the very western part for Alberg, close to the Swiss border to the very eastern part in the, in the Burgenland. And with, from Vienna, within one uh, hour using the railway, you are reaching the Wachau with the famous uh, Dürnstein and, uh, and Melk and other uh, beautiful cities. You are reaching the, the wine viertel where uh, wine is growing as well. And but Vienna is famous for wine growing, of course. And you are reaching Bratislava within one hour. You are reaching even the, the mountains for skiing within one hour to the Semmering. Uh, which is uh, also UNESCO World Heritage. So if you haven't been there, uh, I hope I could convince you so far uh, that you would once uh, uh, consider to come to Vienna. This is an area of you uh, with the historic city. Uh, the historic center was founded as a Roman uh, castrum, but not the important one. The more important is uh, on the way on the Danube, uh, that's Carnuntum, the, that was a very big city in that time. The famous uh, Roman emperor Mark Aurel uh, was writing poems, but he was also defending the Limes. Uh, and uh, Vienna was not of great importance at that time. It was a military uh, custom, but it's still visible. The, the former U Jewish uh, uh, quarter uh, in the medieval time is more or less the, the, the area uh, of the of the, the Roman Castrum and what is now the Herrengasse where the famous palais are. This was so to say the bypass on the way uh, to the to Carnuntum, which is the more important. And as you know, in the middle of the of the 19th century, there was the, the walls have been torn down, which was a good idea because it didn't work anymore. And it was in a nice uh, infrastructure which came up, the so-called ring. And many, many important buildings have been uh, organized uh, around the rink, the university, uh, the parliament, uh, uh, the Hofburg uh, around uh, uh, Heldenplatz. I will show another image uh, in addition. Uh, afterwards, the state opera and uh, the museum building. So it was a very uh, important project, by the way. It was one of the first competitions in Europe with also European contributions and the best ideas have been combined uh, along the rink. And this is maybe also an idea which is, uh, was then uh, uh, also very successfully applied uh, with the Vienna model and with test planning as my colleague Bernd Scholl will point out a little bit later. So, mm -hmm. So then some, some uh, slides, um, uh, the roof structure, uh, we are, Vienna still is very much uh, uh, 
uh, structured by the, the development of the late uh, 19th century. Uh, the central Heldenplatz, uh, Hofburg, which is always an important place in these days, uh, uh, demonstrations for, uh, so to say, against climate change for, for uh, uh, important uh, and Fridays for future, but of course also in these days uh, 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 for standing with Ukraine, the Spittelberg uh, historic water, which has its name from a, a, a hospital, uh, the, the museum quarter, uh, which uh, have been former horse, horse stables, which is now a very livable, car-free uh, place uh, with uh, museums and, and, and nice things. And of course, uh, also we are in the city center, uh, the main building, you can see uh, it behind me. And this is a, a, a picture during a night. Uh, it was uh, built uh, uh, as a uh, uh, Ecole Polytechnique, as, as uh, it would be said in, in France and also in, in Switzerland, like ETH, a Polytechnic uh, University. And we celebrated uh, already 200 years, so in, in uh, 2015, so 200 years uh, of education. And uh, we are still there. And we say uh, the uh, city is, so to say, is our campus. And as you can see here, there was a big discussion at the beginning uh, of uh, 2000, where there was the idea to transform the whole university to what we now call Aspen Lakeside, the former airfield uh, across the Danube. Uh, it was a nice idea for the city. And I think it was uh, insofar good because there was a great estimation as there was the idea, uh, you can't make urban development without a new university. But then we started the discussion and we combined and uh, uh, checked all the, uh, all the opportunities. And then we found out what was quite clear for us as spatial planning planners that this very central location is the best. And the Karlsplatz uh, with the uh, Karlskirche, St. Charles Church, which was built after, so to say, uh, the, of the fights uh, 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 with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, is, which is a very great uh, Baroque church. And there is a, the greatest cultural density along, along uh, around Karlsplatz. And of course, also uh, the, the very well connected place because three underground lines are crossing here. Yeah, uh, the Vienna underground is uh, still a backbone. It was, so to say, invented in the 70s, 80s, and it's still extended and it's very comfortable uh, in, in com combination with bus and uh, of course with uh, trains from Austrian Federal Railways and, uh, and with uh, many other uh, techniques. And it's a backbone. And uh, uh, for urban planning, it's always uh, important to, to consider the backbone. So we have the, the green and the blue infrastructure with Vienna Woods, the Danube Island, the Danube itself, and many other smaller rivers. And we have, of course, uh, the, the water uh, uh, supply, which was a great idea of the late 19th century as well, where there was the idea to have water from the mountains in direct flow uh, with, uh, so to say, pipelines uh, uh, working with gravity only to the, uh, to the city. And more or less more than 90% of the water uh, is uh, provided from fountain water from the mountains. And this uh, brings uh, Vienna in a very comfortable situation. And in the um, 70s and 80s, where it was not clear that Vienna will grow again because the fall of the Iron Curtain was 89. But there was the idea we need an underground uh, and Vienna is on the way to reach 2 million uh, inhabitants again, which was the case at the end of the 19th century. And uh, the underground and the public transport is of utmost importance. This leads me to Vienna main station, which was uh, quite recent, let's say, uh, in, in the 2000s, a very, very important idea, which was well prepared for a long time, even what I would say after the, uh, after the end of the monarchy uh, and uh, after World War I, even at the early, uh, 20th century, there were the first ideas, but it was never established. This leads to the idea that uh, uh, important spatial infrastructure takes quite a long time, and there's a long delay time until it will, will work, but it was done, done very, very well, and then built in a very quick time, and it was the idea to join 
uh, to uh, terminal station, uh, the railway station south and east to a, a joint uh, station. And this works very well. And the benefit was that to the, to, due to the reorganization, a new urban quarter of 55 hectares have been gained, uh, which was, so to say, an important uh, contribution to what we call inward development, not development to the outskirts, not to the fringe, not to the greenfield, but the transformation and renewal uh, of valuable land already in use. And this uh, yeah, is livable very well. You can see here the, uh, the, the comparison. It's uh, almost uh, for those who have been to Vienna, it's half part of the Josefstadt, uh, which has 108 hectares and 55 hectares have been gained. Yeah, coming to the fringe, to the Vienna woods, and I'm coming to the end uh, gradually. Uh, Vienna is also a city where wine is growing and it's a very good wine, I would say. Um, you can trust me, I'm uh, also uh, grown up in Upper Austria where more beer and schnapps is the idea, but uh, the Vienna wine is, is very, very valuable. And also the, uh, the big troubles we had in the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, which gave an, a, a great improvement. And it was also a wise decision in the, in the late 19th century to protect this hilly side, uh, Vienna woods, and to grow wine there. And you can see here a few uh, on the uh, 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 other parts, so to say, of Vienna, uh, Trans Danubia, as we say also in Vienna. And when we have uh, meetings with our students and together with Bern Scholl, we had very nice meetings, also a European and international doctoral college. And we always started in Vienna Woods with an upper row, as I learned from uh, Bern Scholl uh, on, on Sunday evening. Then we had a very good start and very uh, valuable discussions uh, the whole week then. Yeah, some insight, uh, urban development planning. Uh, I have sent ahead uh, the uh, document, but we can also have the extended uh, version. Vienna has a very, very long tradition in urban development planning. Currently, the so-called STEP, Stadtentwicklungsplan in Austrian German urban development plan, currently 20, uh, 25, 2025 is uh, in power, but the city is still working on the next, which will be called uh, 2035. So the idea is more or less every 10 years it is renewed and great uh, uh, ideas are embedded. Uh, and it's a strategic document which then leads in the follow-up to uh, land use planning, zoning, uh, built-up planning, and so all the, the legally binding uh, things. And uh, gr great uh, efforts are undertaken, and we are we are we have the benefit that still not too many could be more, but still a great uh, uh, number of people quite many graduates from our universities are working for the city of Vienna. And of course we have a very good uh, contact. Yeah, then it's time to uh, change to more insight uh, to the Danube Island, the Dan Donau Insel, uh, which started uh, the career as a Entlastungsgerinne. I don't even know the word in, in, in English, but uh, Dr. Eignam, you can, can help me then afterwards. Uh, but uh, the Danube Island was uh, a really a success story. And, and if there is uh, good days in summer, maybe 300,000 uh, people are using this Danube Islands. This is more or less uh, the, the number after the, the, before the fall of the Iron Curtain, Vienna was more or less 1.4 million inhabitants. And the idea was, yeah, if we can keep it stable, then it would be great. No one maybe, or not quite many in that time, considered that the Iron Curtain will fall. And uh, I will hope that it will not fall again in these days. And uh, no one did consider that Vienna will grow, but which is the case uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtains. And it's quite close that Vienna will reach again uh, 2 million inhabitants. And Vienna would have a great problem if the Danube Island wouldn't be there. So this is also quite wise in, in, in planning, not only to solve a problem, but also to avoid a problem. The Danube is also, of course, for us, a nice uh, opportunity uh, to peacefully explore uh, our neighbor countries. And we undertook a series of master projects in our planning curriculum 
from the origins of the Danube to the Delta in the Black Sea, and it was a great experience, uh, and I wouldn't uh, miss that. Some advertisement at the end, uh, I mentioned before in the, in the smaller group, uh, the Association of European uh, Schools of Planning, which is, so to say, uh, uh, equal to the ACSP, the American uh, Collegiate Schools of Planning Association, and we had great conferences uh, in, in the times uh, when I worked as uh, served as treasurer uh, for for ASOP. We had a great conference in Chicago, and I hope that will uh, there's more to come. Uh, in these days, we are preparing a conference in Tartu, which is the second biggest city in uh, Estonia after Tallinn, and we will hope, of course, that it will work and maybe we can uh, welcome some of you. Two publications, uh, not to forget at the end, uh, based on uh, initiatives by my estimated colleague, Bernd Scholl. Uh, this is spatial and transport infrastructure. You can download it for free uh, on, the, on the basis of, uh, of the German RL Academy of Spatial Planning uh, within the Leibniz community. And it's studying, so to say, it is orient um, East Met uh, corridor, including the Balkan area. And this is also a statement, spatial planning matters. Thank you very much for, uh, for listening to me. And uh, uh, I look forward to the presentation of Bernd Scholl and of course to the dialogue and the exchange with you afterwards. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Many thanks, Professor. Uh, Foyt for uh, this uh, intervention. I mean, we know that you are a, a seasoned uh, a city planner. Uh, didn't know that you are such a, a great patriot of Austria and you presented Vienna really pretty, pretty well. Many Thank thanks you. for that. Thank you. I'm a patriot of Europe and I'm a patriot of the good uh, transatlantic connections we are also celebrating today and in these days. Excellent. Uh, on that note, uh, I would uh, now invite uh, Professor uh, Scholl to, to uh, step up and to come up with his presentation. Please, Professor Scholl, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you hear me and you see the slides. Okay, thank you for this. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to be with you in this um, uh, webinar, and I really look forward uh, for our discussion, of course, later on. As you can see here, this is a nice picture of the new Danube and the old Danube. And uh, it gives me the opportunity to say that water is the source of life. And that is the reason why so many well-known cities are located close to the sea, to the lakes and to the river. And as an urban planner, um, water is still a fascinating element for urban development. But we also know uh, sometimes it could be an enemy, uh, not only a friend. And you will see uh, that this is part of the history uh, with all the flood pro problems which existed in Vienna and were the reason um, to overcome these problems. So it's on the one hand a visionary example of dealing, dealing with urban floods, but uh, it's also a story of success because in the very beginning it was a single purpose project. It was a project against the flood to overcome the problems with the flood. You see it on the left side, 1979. And then a few years, a decade, a little bit more than a decade later, you see um, the new island and the new Danube, which was the solution for the problem. And it mooted to um, a multifunctional project, which for a spatial planner is a, one of the most interesting in some examples. I still can say only this, because of this uh, project, a lot of people who only think spatial planning is a lot of theory, but not of practice, 
you can um, downsize it to this project and then a lot of people are fascinated and and deal more interested with it give me the opportunity to a short uh, prologue and then i will come very quickly to the danube case and then at the end to some conclusions and maxims. As I told you, it started with a monofunctional flood water protection and mutated, mutated multifunctional urban development, which later on was published as the Viennese model. And you could say really um, that it is the root of collaborative planning processes like the test plan on, uh, uh, method, which was mentioned by my esteemed colleague, um, Andreas Voigt. For those who are really interested to go more into it, this publication is a classic um, book for it. It is in German, available only in German. And one of the uh, sentences I have noticed from that time is uh, what Jakob Maurer told to us as young students. And when I was with him in Vienna, he said the most far reaching mistakes in planning are made in the very beginning. So if you make mistakes and you try to repair them later, it's much more cost intensively, organiz organizational intensively, resources intensively. So you should have a method which allows you to see, to get a very good overview about what could go wrong and maybe what will be go wrong in order to avoid it. So as planners, we are also trained, uh, as a Swiss poet said, uh, to, to think about the most difficult uh, situation that could happen. You should think about it in order to avoid it. And you will see that this was uh, the very beginning mistakes are also made uh, at could be made in in uh, with the Danube. As my colleague uh, said, it is the second longest um, river in Europe, going through uh, a lot of countries you know, starting in Germany and going to the Black Sea. And Vienna, of course, is in a strategic, strategic uh, position. By the way, the longest river is the Volga, the river Volga. It's more than 4,000 kilometers. So, and then later on, very later on, the, the river Rhine comes, which is uh, the river of, which has the most ship load. Yeah? So um, the Donau is a, source of life for all these countries, very rich countries at their time. And you can see that as all rivers, um, because they had floods, uh, the, the rivers were seeking for space. And on the left side, you can see the, the small Vienna as it was in the 18th century, very small. Maybe you have the picture in mind of Andreas Volk, how it was grown. At that time, probably 20,000 20, inhabitants, nowadays 2 million in, uh, let's say, 300 years. That is the, the history. And the 2 million were even 100 years and more than 100 years ago. But you can see that the river Danube really had space in order to flood um, and the soil uh, to enrich. Uh, but as the history shows, Um, it's a story of strengthening. Yeah? That was the idea of all the water engineers, hydraulic engineers, to make the water speed higher, to accelerate the water speed in order uh, to, uh, to uh, with the increase of the speed, to avoid the flood, which at a certain time worked, but uh, you can see um, later on, uh, it didn't work for a couple of times also before, but uh, when the flood was not there, it was used for recreation purposes. Yeah. Still at that time, it was in the 30s of the last century, 
when people from uh, the other part of the Danube, mainly of the other part of the Danube, used it as a recreation area. They call it Transdanubia. I think it is still used, that word. Cisdanubia and Transdanubia, I learned that word. And the world was completely different from Cisdanubia. Different mentalities, different um, social, uh, uh, social groups living on uh, the, the other side, the Transnubian side of Vienna. And a lot of important decisions were made, again, at the river uh, Danube. Um, after the Second World War, it was one of the decisions a very wise decision to um, locate, uh, to apply for the location of UN um, institution. And 1975, close to the Danube, the so-called UN city was um, developed. Uh, it was, of course, a very uh, good location close to the, to the river. But it was on the other side. And one of the ideas behind was to bring development on the other side uh, of Vienna, because at that, even on that time, 1975, people thought that um, Vienna will grow and they should make the step over the Danube, because the Danube was a border at that time as well. And uh, um, you could see the, the big forelands, as we say, which were flooded from time to time and uh, still not used uh, permanently, but uh, as I showed you before, for recreational purposes before. There always were some flood events. Um, here is the example for 1975. And um, a little later, the collapse of the Reichsbrücke, one of the most important bridges, which has a lot of consequences, but showed that these kind of floods are also an enemy for the structures close by because with a lot of uh, with wetness and uh, the powers of the streaming river, um, it is difficult to maintain these uh, bridges. So um, it is also important to reduce the flood or to avoid it even. Here you have an overview about all the flood events which, which are reported starting uh, now, uh, you could say 600 years ago, uh, 1500. We had the biggest one, the biggest event with uh, 14,000 cubic meters per second, which is an unbelievable amount of water you can imagine. And the one I showed you, 1975, you could see it is um, more than half of it. Yeah? And uh, you could see how close the water was uh, to the surface, to the, to the river banks. And the last one, which is reported, was 2013 with 11,000. And I can tell you that uh, it was no problem for Vienna at all. The island was a little flooded, but it was planned that it could be flooded, it resisted, and it was opened after cleaning the island a little bit and used as it uh, was before, as one of the most important recreation areas uh, of Vienna. As I told you, in the very beginning, uh, the big mistakes are made, and a lot of um, Civil servants from the city of Vienna saw one kilometer of this trapez construction, block uh, stones on both sides with the same angle of the riverbanks. That was the idea. And it was built one kilometer. And these civil servants said, if, that, if we do that 21 kilometer long, maybe we make a big mistake. And that was the reason to stop the works and to think about other solutions, which um, then were found in a competition, which was made under very important uh, planning offices, interdisciplinary mixed, not only engineers, but also landscape architects and urban planners, civil engineers, and so on. The idea of the uh, 
you could say the principle of this new uh, Danube is very easy. You make an excavation of a channel and that material you put aside in order to make um, a relief uh, on the one hand on both sides um, to uh, make even um, the, the dam a little bit higher as you can see it on the on the right side the right bank of the danube and use uh, enormous amount of this um, excavation to make a new island in the middle and as i told you before the idea was to have a 20 uh, kilometer long 21 kilometer long um, profile which should be similar from the beginning to the end that could have been the mistake and in order to overcome it the competition was made and it led to a new construction which at the end uh, lead to um, one of the most interesting uh, combinations of flood protection on the one hand, but also um, as a recreational area for the Viennese people. You see the amount of um, the money which was used is 500 million euro. I, I still was astonished when I was reading it for such an amount of money, you can build a stadium nowadays uh, sometimes or another big construction. And um, one of the reasons why, why it is um, relatively cheap, uh, you could say, is that the material was used. It had not to be located on other places. You could use it and um, you could use it in a very good way. So, you could say it was a paradigm shift in hydraulic engineering because in the very beginning, as I told you before, it was accelerating of the water instead to retain and to store. It was uh, to preserve habitat of the water body instead of land reclamation and greenfield development and to design shallow multi facilitated banks instead of steep monotonous ones to provide refugial zones as well for nature instead of de developing everything for recreationists so even there it was very well thought about how to organize it for that and at the end to endow groundwater bodies instead of cutting them off in order to organize the whole um, construction works. It was developed a so-called guiding project for the Danube in German light project. And on the left-hand side, you see uh, the, 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 um, the assignment of Professor Maurer. He, he signed, uh, he was a Swiss. Maybe that was the reason not to take a, someone from, uh, from Vienna or from Austria because he was from outside and uh, not too strongly involved in all these political issues, which of course in a city like Vienna are um, uh, uh, existing. So he was building up trust with the whole procedure, with the competition, with the collaboration of uh, the people. And um, you could see even during the construction period, the people came to the riverbanks and used it in summer days. So they, uh, it's uh, sometimes what uh, you, of course, are uh, looking for in planning that people use it for the purpose you had in mind. Yeah, so it is one of the big issues for all those who are creating ideas that at the end you can see it realized. And I know the project um, uh, leader of, of the Danube area, I was with him for several times um, very deeply in the, in the field. And he was um, organizing the caterpillars in order to make the landscape as it should be. Yeah? Because you, at that time, you couldn't even make it in plants so well in order to form and uh, to, to, to create the landscape as it, as it should be. 
another very interesting uh, part of it is that you see here the old one and the new one. The new one has clear water. You can even swim in it, of course. The water, um, uh, the water, uh, the water speed is lower as in the other one because you have constructions on uh, on both ends and can steer the uh, speed of the water inside of the new Danube. But one thing you can see here a little bit is the are the green bridges uh, on the former foreland, which was not the idea in the very beginning. Uh, in contrary, the idea was to have the new Danube highway on the top of the dam. Can you imagine? That would mean that the whole noise would have gone to the recreation areas on the one hand and on the living areas on the other side. So at my time, when I came to the project as a young scientist and assistant of Professor Maurer, one of the big issues was to move um, this highway uh, back to the, to the dam and to bridge it with, at that time, um, green bridges, we called it. Later on, it, the green bridges mutated to tunnels uh, because the people knew that uh, no noise would even be better than have uh, only a, a little noise. And it was also noticed that, of course, the, the value of the land and of the housing projects would increase if you could raise the noise as well, not only the flood problems. So this is also a success. And you see a, a construction. It is from the beginning of the 2000 years. How close they are now to the Danube. It's not um, an enemy anymore. It's a, a friend and the Danube, as the old one and the new one, are very important elements um, for the urban um, development of the city. And even the UNO city, which is now the Vienna International Center, developed, um, new institutions came, the Vienna Fair and so on and so on. So it was a nucleus in the very beginning or the end of the 70s. And nowadays, the jump over the Danube has already been um, developed. And we have to be aware that too much greenfield development on Transdanubian could be also a mistake. So to have this inward development uh, along the, uh, the public transport um, elements should be one of the strategies for the future, not only in the old part of Vienna, but also to the new part. Here you can see. Uh, these uh, highway constructions close to the to, to some of the housing, and on the other hand, um, the green bridges uh, on the other side, which which I have shown you before. So for the future, it is also to, to the idea to have even more green bridges in order to uh, to reduce noise at those parts uh, as well, and. As uh, Andreas Volk told you before, uh, it is used. You have uh, 300,000 people, and only a few are coming by car. And that means you have to have a very good public transport system, not only along the river, but also crossing the river. And one of the big parties in Vienna is uh, every year the Donauinselfest, uh, which is uh, the contrapoint to the city party, uh, which is uh, still existing and has more tradition. But at that time, they thought we should uh, bring um, the island and the new Danube to the people. And that is the reason why um, uh, that uh, feast was uh, created as well. You can see the public transport system, which is one of the most uh, developed transport system in a Europe city. It's the backbone of development. And a lot of money is put into it. It's very, really a very, very good uh, system. And even on the island, you have we have a stop, uh, which is called Donau Insel. And it was it's just a, a small uh, issue. But uh, at that time, when they were planning it, there was no window uh, looking to, to the Donau, uh, Donau Island. And with a long and strong discussions with the civil engineers of this new bridge, 
at the end, they allowed to make windows in the bridge. So when you come with the underground, you will notice that you are on the Danube Island. That's a very a small story, but it shows you how important uh, even these issues are. A coming to an end and to, uh, to, to the, to the conclu conclusions, we can discuss it, of course, a little bit more in depth later on. First of all, we need a competition of ideas instead of a plan who is made by, a, and even if the engineer or the architect or the urban planner is the most famous of the world, we should have a competition of ideas. And we have to organize it in a very severe and of course fair way. We have a long tradition of competitions uh, in architecture, but here in Vienna, it was introduced in that scale at that time. Huh? Then we have a drastic reduction of hierarch hierarchical levels between those who are responsible for policy, technical management and the designing teams. So um, Andreas Freuk mentioned it, every um, three months, the whole crew was there for one week and even the mayor and uh, the responsible mayor for that uh, uh, construction were available in, di in direct exchange, exchange with the people who were um, developing the, the construction in order to get um, a very clear impression about the pros and the contrasts of different solutions. A clear differentiation role and clear roles for internal and external communication. This is very important. At that time, they created a, an office in the city of Vienna where all the important materials, books, plans, and everything were stored in order to invite um, the public um, to see what they were discussing and uh, that there was no mistrust anymore as it was before. Then, of course, we need a time limitation of the process for this ad hoc organization because the usual organizations, they see additional organizations very often as you could say enemies. Yeah? And in order to avoid this, um, you could say it is an organization, organization which is limited for a certain time in order to support the others, not to be uh, let's say a competitor of the usual organizations. I think a lot of you know what I'm talking about. And then of course, you need the limitation of um, means. You need um, that the time, uh, that the, 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 the know-how of the people is not paid in a very, let's say complicated way. In Vienna, they started, they said, you work three months for us, you are paid for these three months. And they, need it, they, you, they knew it in beforehand what uh, all the resources would amount to. So this is the organigram of these um, ad hoc organizations, which at least, at least lasted for three years. And you see in the meeting, the, in, the, in the midst, there is this steering committee, which had a small office. Then you had the teams, which were working in competition. And uh, above the steering committee, you had the execute, executive, uh, executive represent, representatives from politics, and sometimes nowadays also from entrepreneurs. In that time, it was only from politics. And that board is discussing with the public and the committees. At the time, 50 years ago, sometimes engineers and architects um, went directly to the public. And then you can imagine there was a lot of uh, cacophony, which of course was counterproductive uh, for the project. So here it was very clearly, uh, the rule was very clearly that only the ex executive represent representatives should have the contact to the public and the committees, the boards, and so on. And the steering committee, and this is something which I learned in Vienna and still is now uh, alive in a lot of other planning processes, the independency of the majority of the steering committee. So the civil service were in that committee, 
but the majority came from outside and were experts in their fields, engineers, architects, urban planners, with the, uh, the chair of the board was Professor Maurer, as I mentioned. The group was, was very, very small, only um, 11 people when I remember. Yeah, and uh, it, it, is all, it is a very um, uh, important issue to keep that. And it, 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 it creates a lot of discussion always if we create new ad, ad hoc organizations how that um, should be organized, but this is the rule and I can tell you it works. Normally you have a ping pong of, um, of uh, different uh, acts, actions and, and decisions and nobody knows really how it works. Yeah? So in that case, the idea was to get a rhythm of uh, acting and decision-making and in Vienna every three months we had these meetings of one week, which of course nowadays is a little bit shorter. At that time, they spent really that work like in a monastery. No one had uh, the, the possibility to escape. Yeah? They were talking from the morning to the evening. Sometimes uh, in the evenings, they were at the Heurigen yeah? in the, because the informal discussions were also very important and sometimes even more important than the formal discussions. So, um, yeah, that is my uh, short presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. When I look at those images, I'm reminded um, why Vienna is ranked at the top or very close to the top almost every year for livability. We don't have much time left, so I thought what we could do is um, just invite some thoughts from uh, Matt and, and Daniel, and so, so very briefly, observations, impressions about parallels or not um, with your own work uh, along the Potomac um, in the now eight, nine, ten minutes that are left. And then hopefully we'll have time to open up to question and answer from, from, um, from, from the audience. Matt, what were some? How did? What were some of the things that you thought related to what you are involved with in the Potomac, uh, as you were listening to the presentations from Doctors Scholl and, and Foyt? Well, I, I really like the idea of you know the multi-purpose, right? Um, really looking at how we look at the green and blue infrastructure and how we bring those in and in, in the built environment, and really looking at water as a resource as a whole. I had to throw up a couple maps, you know, focus of spatial planning matters. I can't live without maps and, and looking at the big picture. So this is our Potomac River, DC. You know, we're, we're about 11,500 uh, square miles of watershed above us in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia, coming down into the Chesapeake Bay. We've been um, working with folks like uh, the state, the Virginia Coastal Res Resilience Master Planning effort has mapped some of our climate change scenarios for us. Uh, and so we've been looking, looking at um, how that's gonna affect us and how we adapt uh, and, and build in more resilience. Our friends, Dan's here in Alexandria, friends in Arlington, and you can see the outline of Washington, DC. So it, the Potomac's title about to chain bridge road. So we're dealing about riverine flooding as well as tidal flooding, uh, coastal flooding due to uh, sea level rise and storm surge. Um, in addition to looking at uh, the impacts on our communities, uh, we have some great resources from NOAA that we've been looking at, the change in, in plant communities along the Potomac River as well, uh, including Dyke Marsh. So um, again, there's a lot of overlap uh, with what we're doing as we look into some of our most flood prone areas. Uh, we recently built up a levee, a traditional levee in Huntington, but we're also looking at ways not just to look at the flooding, but look at the rec recreation opportunities, uh, integrating sidewalks, uh, trails into those systems. We're also trying to better figure out how to manage New Alexandria area where we have tidal flooding and surge that comes up. I think one parallel um, 
you talked about natural resources and integrating them. One thing I'd say that's unique to this area of DC as a region is we really start preserving stream valleys, even going back into the 1960s and 70s. We had our first, on the map on the left, just kind of shows a series of all our floodplains. And over time, since the 1970s, we've integrated those into stream valley parks. And that's, as we look at resilience, that has proven to be a great tool in resiliency. So we really don't have flooding of homes along these corridors. But again, we still have these older neighborhoods along the Potomac that are having flooding issues. Um, I'll stop there and let Dan and Celso jump in. But by the way, I think I'm already buying my ticket to come over and, and see this great project. Very good, yeah, and I'll follow, I'll follow you, so we should just make it a, a plan. Um, I just wanted to complement what uh, Matt just said, that um, I mean, these, these are lessons that are very well applied everywhere in the world, situations where we have a resource like a major river, and in our case, close to um, close to an estuary, which is a big bay. In, in Alexandria, what I find myself doing all the time is dealing with the effects of ultra-urbanization, meaning we have high levels of imperviousness in the city that has been building up for the past 300 years. And um, in, in addition to burying the streams that we used to have in stream valleys now are in pipes. So we have a, a completely different situation where flooding occurs because of the inadequacies of that stone drainage system that was built a long time ago. We have pipes that could be 100 years old for all we know. In addition to that complication, Alexandria is a historic city and uh, there are valuable archeological sites in the city. So sometimes installing something is actually very difficult because one never knows if you start digging a hole whether you're going to find an old pipe or an archaeological site. So that complicates the situation. When we find the solutions to these problems, um, often we find that they have to be um, resolved almost like a jigsaw puzzle because there's so much stuff on the ground. So we, it's not a simple decision to say, we're going to take this pipe out, or we're going to put a bigger pipe instead, or we're going to store some water here. Uh, to shape the peak of the flood. There is so much infrastructure, so many businesses, so many houses and roads, that those decisions are, uh, this decision how big the pipe should be is almost like inconsequential compared to all the things that need to be happening for that uh, improvement to take place in the city. Um, so we, we still have those situations. We, these, these uh, solutions take time and we need to uh, work with the public and an advisory committee, which is a group of citizens that are interested in solving this problem and working side by side with the city to find these solutions and have a, a dialogue. So I like this model of dialogue that um, Dr. Shaw presented because it really, this, that's what we do most of the time. We spend a lot of our time talking to people. What are your problems? This is a potential solution. What do you think about it? Are there any problems that you feel that would be caused by trying to solve this other problem? So communication is very important in what we do. Uh, I'm going to stop here and let Celso fill in from the academic side. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, I wanted to highlight one key aspect that um, I think was really well explaining and demonstrated. Um, in the presentations, which is the idea of having the water as an enemy and the need for this paradigm shift in hydraulic engineering, and really the way we think about um, flood planning as a whole and the idea of having the water as a friend. So using the water as our alley and the concept of being able to live with the water and not trying to fight the flood against the flood. So all these words, all this connotation imply they were going against the water. And then in reality, we really want to be living in harmony with the water. However, we're, we're left with this um, inheritance in which hydraulic engineering has historically 
fought the fight, fought the flood, and we developed in a way that now we're we're in the midst of this, you know, like a highly urbanized place with uh, inadequate infrastructure that was designed to push the water out. As as it was shown, it doesn't work anymore. And furthermore, we're now at a place here in Washington DC that we're seeing sea level rise. So we have high rates of historical sea level rise. We've seen a fit one foot of um, historic sea level rise in the past hundred years. Uh, who knows how much more we're gonna get in the future. And we're seeing the impacts of that in the current infrastructure, in our recreation, the cherry blossoms are being impacted. And, the, and there's a tremendous impact in our area. And one other thing I wanted to highlight for the viewers is that uh, they showed a flood event from the 1500s, and that was the biggest flood on record. Our, our flood record here goes back to the 1900s and like 1930s, 20s. Imagine what we have in store if we were to see flood events of that magnitude that we don't really know uh, what's coming our way. So I, you know, I thought that was fascinating to see this great example of how they were able to turn around this paradigm shift of the monofunctional flood control structure to this multifunctional in a space that they're now able to bring 300,000 people together from a recreational perspective in a safe manner. So, and, and really a great example of being able to live in harmony with the water in a, in a big city, in a, in a very large metropolitan area. So I'll stop here so we have time to hear from, from everybody else too, but I just wanted to highlight, I think that's a key paradigm shift that we ought to be thinking about when we're planning um, our development with water. Thank you so much, Johannes. Um, why don't you take over the Q&A? Thank you. Uh, on that note, I would now like to open uh, up for a Q&A session. And uh, if you want to, to ask a question, you uh, in the audience, please uh, raise your virtual hand. And um, uh, yeah, and then uh, um, present yourself. And please keep it rather short because we are already running a bit out of time, but I think we should still invest a few minutes just for a Q&A. Please, uh, whoever wants to, 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 to inter interfere. Um, I can't see anybody, is this my fault? No. Is there anybody uh, wishing to delve a little bit deeper and uh, ask a few questions? All right, here we go. We have Howard here. Howard, please, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. So actually, I was just clapping um, <laughs> uh, at the presentation. It was uh, it was superb. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I, I don't know. This may be too long a question, but um, the 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 one thing that struck me about the process that the owner used or or the the jurisdiction there was. Um, soliciting other opinions, soliciting uh, other ideas and the use of a um, competition. Um, this, of course, is a very different approach than we use here. Um, almost, uh, we almost never use a competition for a project like this that, 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 I, can, that I can recall. So quickly, the question is, um, do, do any of the um, any of the attendees that um, are, um, are in the local area here imagine ways that we can reasonably solicit this diversity of ideas? I think this is a question first and foremost to our US participants on the panel. I, I would just add that Definitely the idea of design challenges or of collaborating across. And I saw that you guys actually paid some of these folks to come in with different ideas. I think that's a great opportunity. We see that in different practices. We've used it to help develop some of our urban design standards, um, but it is a great way to, to bring in multiple ideas. I know there's for stormwater across the country, there's been some cities that have done more of that where uh, to develop their green infrastructure, um, 
guidelines. They brought in multiple uh, firms and had that design ch challenge to come up with the best solution. I'll just agree with Matt. I would throw in the, um, the thing it's very important also, and as you well know, Skip, to find the proper timing for these kinds of collaborations. And usually the best time is when there's a big piece of land that is ready for redevelopment. So what we want to see in it is, is very important, but also it has an impact on, on the surrounding area because it's such a large chunk of land. All right. Uh, uh, does either Professor Scholl or Professor Freud want to comment on, on the, the question that has been raised to have this, this kind of competition? And I mean, was this easy at the beginning or was this something that developed over time? Uh, was this envisaged or this, this, did this come rather spontaneously? Could you just uh, tell us a bit how this uh, that came? came? Uh. Maybe I, I um, say some words to it. You, you may know that um, Professor Maurer came from Switzerland, I mentioned it, and he always uh, was a supporter of the idea of competitions because Switzerland is such a model. Now we have 26 cantons and each canton uh, has power. Yeah? Uh, they have their own financing system, their own school system, and so on and so on. And uh, I, I, I discussed it with him several times, and he said it is always important to empower people who take the initiative and have ideas, because they have ideas, and you should empower them to bring the ideas. And I think that convinced um, the people, the, the political people in Vienna in a certain way. Of course, you have to communicate it in a way that it is accepted. And they said, what do we have to lose? Uh, if there is no idea better than the first one, we, we go back to the first one. So we, 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 um, uh, we invest some money, we invest some resources, and then we will see. So it's a stepwise development. You cannot make a mistake in order to empower ideas because you always have the possibility to go the, the step back. And that convinced um, the political leaders at that time uh, in Vienna. And of course, the Viennese um, group of architects and engineers, they are, they are uh, like, um, they want to have competition because they have so long tradition of um, competing to each other. As uh, Andreas Volk said, the first competition in urban development was in Vienna with the ring. So there, were, there was also a certain tradition and you could bridge it uh, from uh, some decades and say you have that tradition. So why not doing it at that time? And both, I think, helped uh, to go that way. And then the engineers and architects did really a very, very good job. And you have to bring, uh, to bring together the best ideas in that light project. It is not in the way that there was a winner, a, a office. It was the idea, if we put together the best ideas of the different offices, that is the project, that is the puzzle, you could say, we want to puzzle. And that is exactly the extract of our um, uh, kind of procedures we are doing now in, in Germany, in Austria, and, and in Switzerland and some other countries. Thank you. Perfect. I see Camille uh, raising uh, the hand. Uh, Camille, please, please go ahead. Hey everybody, thank you so much for this great um, presentation. I was curious with your with your competitions, if you had multiple pieces of different ideas that, that you liked, you, you didn't like just one, but you like different parts and pieces, could you combine them into your final project? Is that is that what you did um, with this or did you really just hone in on your top favorite and then just add in pieces to theirs? 
No, it's, exac it's exactly how you described it. You take out the best ideas of each team and then you make the puzzle and the puzzle is that what I showed you, the light project, the guiding plan. We do not say master plan, which is interesting. Yeah. Also in Europe, we use that word very often but the master plan very often suggests you, you have a blueprint and you just can transform it to reality. And the guiding project means you have a direction where you would to follow. And then time by time, you can see how you can calibrate it to that what is coming up uh, as a surprise, for example. So you see, there is a different tradition maybe which means urban planning and spatial planning is full of surprises, even if you have a project and you have to reflect it and you have to prepare to it. And that means guiding instead of master. And it's important to say to the offices and before the teams uh, to pick out the best ideas and they have to agree, of course. Yeah? This is different, of course, to architecture competitions where one office one architect at the end is realizing the building so that is a different but if you mention it in beforehand it's no problem all the very well-known offices agree to it if they know it from the very beginning on and then a follow-up if i may um is that is that for the people that put forth ideas and, and took this time, did you provide them with a stipend or was there any uh, prize money that, that came about that kind of like, like got them to, to do the assessment? No, there was a lot of work for all of the teams who were involved later on. Uh, someone planned um, a, a landscape area here, someone other, a technical infrastructure structure there. So there was a, a full basket of projects where you can pick out those or you could join those projects who were very close to the offices before or the main idea of that office in order to give them the additional opportunity to realize later on. And that is what happened. Thank you. All right, I think this brings us to the end of this webinar. I mean, I could have listened for, for hours and hours and I learned so much about Vienna, many things I didn't know myself. So uh, many thanks uh, for all of you uh, making the time. Uh, many thanks for, for the panelists for, for, uh, for being with us and sharing uh, your thoughts and insights. And I think this should just be a starting point. Uh, I mean, we now started with a webinar. So if, if this helps to, to create person-to-person -person contacts in the future and to delve deeper and to learn more from each other, I think then this uh, webinar would really have uh, made, uh, made uh, an impact. Uh, on, on that happy note, Again, many thanks uh, for your time uh, and yeah, see you around. Uh, greetings from the Austrian Embassy in Washington DC and many thanks uh, Dale uh, also for bringing this uh, together and, 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 and bringing uh, US panelists uh, on the floor. Uh, should not have been the last webinar we do together. Many thank thanks, so uh, greetings thanks, to Europe, thanks, greetings thank to you. US. Thank you.